I'm concerned about the opposition, mate, because I don't know how they're good they're going to be. I can't control that, you know. I'm, I'm concerned about the things that aren't in this building. My guest today is one of the most empathetic, emotionally intelligent managers in the Premier League. Agento arrived at Spurs last season, brought his high octane, all in, audacious football, and made Robbie Williams sing. I love listening to him talk. It's in a style that marries football and inside out in the best of ways. It's a joy to welcome back ahead of his second season with Tottenham Hotspur. It's Mr. Ange Postacogli. Roger, how are you, mate? Oh, I'm better for being with you. First of all, I just want to thank you for all the life truths that you dispensed throughout your press conferences last season. It is, honestly, it's like listening to an Australian Yoda. I loved early <laughs> last season. You captured the essence of fan happiness. Quote, let them get excited. Let them get ahead of themselves. That's the beauty of being a supporter. They think we're going to be world beaters. It's up to us to match that expectation. I could honestly have picked a dozen quotes from you, Ange. These life truths, where do they come from? Do you prepare them beforehand? Or are you just yeah. shooting from the hip, from the heart? Yeah, a little bit of life experience. And I think those kind of things always, you know, are more genuine when they do come from the heart and not scripted. Um, have an idea about maybe what I want to say, but then you kind of search through the the muscle memory of, of your brain and, and things you, you've picked up along the way. And more importantly, how it makes me feel, because ultimately, it's essence, I'm a, I'm a football fan, you know. But how does it make you feel? When you land one, are you like, yes? Or is it <laughs> yeah, no, look, I, hopefully, it, it, what I try and do is hopefully it resonates with people. Um, I think now you know, people understand that's just me, that's who I am, and it's not, like I said, it's not scripted, it's not about me trying to impose my own values or views on people. It's just my outlook on life and my experiences on life and, and people take away what they want from it. Last season, you first in the Premier League. Spurs got off to that flyer and beaten in their first 10 games. Back half of the season, more of a challenge. Big picture, Ange. What's the important lesson that you took from your first season in the Premier League? I, I think everything else I've taken throughout my whole career is that ultimately... Unless what you're doing is anchored in something really solid in terms of beliefs, um, when the rocky times come, it, it, it can be harder to traverse through there. And, and even though we had some tough times, absolutely, um, through probably the middle to back end of the year, um, I still felt as a group we were, you know, we were solid in the way we, we kind of approached things. There wasn't any panic. There wasn't any um, sort of ripping up of plans and, and you know, our ideas. We... We stuck to what we wanted to be and, and who we want to be and, you know, recognise where you fall short and that gives you something to aim for, you know, whereas if you don't have that sort of, like I said, anchor of belief in something um, through those tough times, you can often get lost, you know, and I never felt we got lost last year. We grinded a lot and uh, we weren't as exciting, absolutely, as the beginning of the year, but... I still felt it was anchored in something meaningful. And the belief is in the idea of football. Absolutely. I mean, look, that's, you know, I always go back, well, why was I bought in? And as much as it was about success, there was a real need in this football club to play a certain way. And I'm, I'm never going to lose sight of that. It's what I believe in anyway, so it comes naturally. But invariably, you get to a space where people just say, well, we just want success and nothing else. And I know that's not true because ultimately what this club wants is the game to be played a certain way and then success to follow from there. So I'll stick to that. It won't be easy at times and um, there'll be plenty of people and forces trying to pull me and the club away from that, but um, we've got to stay the course. A lot of your biography is where the idea of football comes from. You talk about how the encyclopedic love of the British game you had yeah. from when you were a kid, getting up in the middle of the night in Australia to watch Premier League games or English football with your dad. Uh, you get shoot sent over weeks later and you'd learn every statistic. You arrived in the Premier League as a winning manager almost everywhere you've been. But did anything about it here, the reality, surprise you? No, nothing surprised me. It, and if anything, I wasn't disappointed um, with my expectations of what I was going to take on. Um, you know, everything is, is magnified to the nth degree. You know, whether that's good, bad or otherwise, um, there's just a amplification of everything you do and my word it's wonderful you know it's what I've craved my whole life because because part of I guess you know who I am today was born out of the fact that growing up in Australia and having such a passion for the game and yet that not being shared by the masses you know lit a fuse inside me that I wanted to get to where that was you know and uh I'm smack bang in the middle of it now, mate. So I'm, uh, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm loving it, you know. I, I've loved every bit of it. Like I said, nothing surprised me, but 
more importantly, nothing fell short of my expectations. I mean, a lot of who you are is rooted in your childhood. I love a story of yours that when you were 12 years old, your dad would take you to watch South Melbourne, the Hellas, and afterwards you'd sit up late at the kitchen table, breaking down the strategy, so much so that when you were at school, the library teacher was put in charge of your high school team at Pratt, but you took over quickly, 12 years of age. You called it your first coaching job, and you said it was bloody early that you realized you were actually born to coach rather than to play. And what did you see in yourself back then? What did you discover in yourself that helped you make that realization? Um, yeah, well, I guess uh, it was something, and I, when I look back on it now, you, like I so said, you're talking about a 12-year-old, and I look at you know, 12 year olds and I go, what was I thinking that I could think I could sort of become, you know, somebody who tells other people what to do? Because I wasn't, you know, in a social sense, I wasn't one of the leaders in the in the sort of playground of of, of politics you go through um, as a kid, you know. I was, I had friends, I had, but I wasn't, you know, I wasn't one of the uh, alpha males by, by any stretch. But when it came to football, for some bizarre reason, everyone was listening to me, you know, and um, and you're right, it wasn't a library teacher, it was actually the music teacher who... Sorry, library teachers. Yeah, that's all right. Doing um, you dirty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he, who, who chose to, to mark the day's uh, <laughs> homework uh, while we were having training that I thought, no, I'm not having this, you know, I'm, I'm going to take over. And uh, why the other 12-year-old boys who, as I said, had it on, on in pretty much everything else, other aspect of their life, decided that, no, we'll listen to this guy you know, telling us what to do. Um, but I, I really, for some bizarre reason, even as a 12-year-old, I felt comfortable in that space, you know. I, I never felt overwhelmed, intimidated. I felt really comfortable and, and maybe because I wasn't as, you know, I was, I was fairly socially awkward away from that. That just gave me an inner confidence and belief that, you know what, this is my world, you know, and, and in this world, I can be who I want to be. It's where you felt yourself. Absolutely. Yeah. Without a shadow of a doubt. Uh, that, and, it's, and it's been a constant in my life, you know, it's, um, it's why I, you know, I talk about the game as, a, as I have because every meaningful relationship I have in my life has come from football. My friends, my wife, my, everything that, that, that is who I am has come through football. And, um, you know, like I said early on, that was my world and it's, it's remained my world. Where's that music teacher now? <laughs> um, Spurs 21-year-old left back, Destiny O'Doggy, played his first season with the team last year. He called your system the hardest by far he's ever played in. I mean, looking at your team right now, it's younger than ever. I think there's only three players over the age of 30. Does that change your approach, your methods? No, not, not necessarily. I mean, I, I think I took over a team that had come to a, an end of a natural cycle, a team that was very, very close to being very, very successful, you know, like within touching distance of a Champions League, uh, second in the Premier League. And that group of players, like I said, like all things in life, I think it was coming to a natural end. So it wasn't just about coming in and changing the way they played their football, but changing the whole squad. And I have always felt when you want major transformation, the more open, willing minds you have, the easier to do that. And young people just tend to have that. You know, they, they have less fear. They've got less scars, um, you know, less trepidation about trying something different. Um, not that you don't need experience. And we're, I was pretty fortunate in that. You know, particularly in Sunny, and um, you know, I had a, an experienced player who was still very much young in mind and heart, you know, willing to embrace something new. But I love the fact that I've got these really fertile minds that I can shape the way I want to, and it's up to me then to to take them on that kind of journey um, and show them the way forward, uh, because they're willing participants. You know, I haven't had to convince them uh, too much, and uh, I guess that's the beauty of it. What can you tell us that will be different about this Spurs team this season? Um, I think we'll have grown a lot from last year of understanding about ourselves. And when we were good, we were exciting. Uh, I think we had everyone talking about us. And then when we had to grind, um, we found a way to get there. But there was obviously a, a, a space in there where we didn't really cope too well with disruptions, which I think is only natural um, because, you know, when things are going well, then it's a lot easier to stay on board something. But we had some disruptions in terms of injuries, in terms of suspensions, you know, some lack of discipline there for sure, which happens with young players. And we didn't cope well with that, but we learned a lot through that. So I think without saying we're going to be a more mature squad, I think we're, we're a better prepared squad this year than we were last year. As you sit here, Ange, what is your number one concern 
other than having to be interviewed by me. No, this is uh, no, this is very enjoyable. The concern I have is always the stuff you can't control. I, I'm concerned about the opposition, mate, because I don't know how they're good they're going to be. I can't control that, you know. I'm, I'm concerned about the things that aren't in this building, you know, and, and that's what kind of keeps me going to say, well, let's not put a limit on how good we're going to be because we just don't know what the opposition and, and what challenges we're going to have through the year. So, And the Premier League is the elite competition and, you know, you look at... Yeah, you know, we finished fifth, but I don't look at that. I look at that we finished, you know, twenty odd points behind the top team, and that's a big gap, you know. And we've got to try and chip away and bridge that gap. And you know, it's not going to happen because you know the teams there, like Man City and Arsenal, are going to stand still. They're going to get better, so we've got to improve at a greater rate than them, and um, that's our challenge. So last season you did finish fifth, Europa League. You were linked fleetingly to the England job, and you put that down. You said we've not achieved anything at Tottenham yet. Until we achieve something, my work is not done. And just looking ahead, what can this team achieve? What are your expectations for the season I'm not ahead? Putting, yeah, I'm not putting a limit on it. I mean, I, what I do want us to achieve is to play the football that we, we want to play on a consistent basis because I think that kind of gives the identity that this football club really wants and, and craves and has, has kind of always had as its backdrop. When you walk around this place, to dare is to do is everywhere. I think that's a reference point to not just uh, mindset, but also actions. And, and for us, that means playing the game a certain way. So that's what I want to do. I want us, and if we do that, then um, there is no limit to what we can achieve. I came here to bring success to the club. As you said, I've had success just about everywhere I've been. Success means trophies, um, and that's got to be our aim. But underpinning all that is you know, to play football that um, everyone talks about and our supporters love. So what is your message to supporters around the world? Supporters have dreams. We're on season's eve. That you also have realities. Between dreams and realities, what should the fans carry in their head and their heart? Yeah, the role of the fan is to to be the dreamers. My role is to be the realist and and let me handle the the stuff that's going to be hard and, and for them to truly enjoy what being a fan of a football club really means. What it means is uh, community, shared experiences, Extreme emotions, nothing wrong with getting frustrated, angry. That's part of being a human being and, uh, and hopefully at the end of it, a, a memory that lasts generations we can pass on to others. It is about the collective generational memories. I believe that more than I can say. Last question for you, Ange. A couple of weeks ago, I don't even know if you remember this, you were stopped by para-professional wrestlers, Finn Baller, JD McDonough, championship winning WWE team. Afterwards, Finn said he had, quote, goosebumps after meeting you. I mean, you don't strike me, Ange, as being a big social media guy unless you've got like a hidden TikTok account that we've not found yet. But is there anyone out there, a well-known figure, who you meeting them, you'd feel goosebumps about? And why? Well, I, I, I get goosebumps. Like, you know, it doesn't have to be somebody who's famous. Just, just meeting people in general. I, I love. And look, I, I don't take for granted that a lot of that is around who are my position, not so much in me as a person. And, but I love the way, you know, the energy that brings when when I do meet people. And uh, you can meet one though, Ange. Anyone, uh, live or dead. Live or dead. Um, goosebumps. Probably Muhammad Ali. Yeah, yeah. Because I, I'll tell you why. Because he transcended his sport, you know, for him, boxing was, you know, part of having that sort of platform to, to speak about things more than just what he was engaged in and what he was excellent in. And, and he entertained me, you know, I, I as a 10 year old, I'd, I'd be running home from school to watch one of his bouts, you know, and I never had any interest in boxing at all, but it was Muhammad Ali, you know, and, uh, yeah, a pick with him would be, uh, yeah, yeah, obviously it can't happen now, but uh, goosebumps. Oh, I thought it would be Shankly. God, be oh, Shanks would have been <laughs> up there as well, mate. No, I mean, but that's what I mean. There's so many people who, and again, he's another one who, it's not so much the football achievements, it's what he stood for, you know, and, and I love that stuff. I love whether it's in sport or in life in general and, you know, people who stand for something beyond what they do. Um, what they do is, you know, obviously uh, excel in their own space, but use that as something more that changes people's or impacts people's lives. I mean, football is at its best when it transcends football to you, to your club and uh, to your family, to your success. Good man, Roger. Courage.